from San Francisco. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube. Covering Oracle Open World 2015. Brought to you by Oracle. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Brian Gracely. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in San Francisco. This is SiliconANGLE's The Cube, our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm Brian Gracely, our cloud analyst at SiliconANGLE Media's Wikibon Research. Our next guest is Indra Singh, the executive vice president of Fusion Middleware uh, Development at Oracle. Great to see you and welcome back to The Cube. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, we love software because one, we're software geeks, but also more importantly, cloud has changed the game on software DevOps. We talk on theCUBE all the time. Brian's a cloud analyst breaking down the competition. Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, all kind of melding together now. And one area that we've always been fascinated with is what is the middleware in this environment? John Fowler was saying, well, it's kind of like a mainframe, but not really a mainframe in the cloud. You get on-prem, you have all these kind of mainframe-like high-performance features in engineered systems. You got encryption now end-to-end. I mean, essentially, a whole new distributed mainframe, if you will. But we all want to know, what does the middleware look like? Is there a standard middleware architecture? Is it pick your own middleware? Open source with Java? It's not quite the same. So I the first question. What is the middleware equation from your standpoint? How would you define it? So let's start to think about what are the personas which a customer deals with the platform, right? Frankly, there are four personas. There's a developer, there's an integrator, there is the business analyst deriving intelligence from the data, and there's the line of business user as well. We see all four of these personas interacting directly with middleware in the cloud. That's what we call platform as a service. The fact though is, I think we can do a lot better in taking our story out to the world. Most customers associate PaaS from Oracle as basically database in the cloud, or perhaps Java in the cloud. We have far more. It's actually integration in the cloud. It's identity management in the cloud. It is process, process cloud service, which is BPM in the cloud. It is sites cloud service, it's documents in the cloud. It's data visualization in the cloud. BI in the cloud, far richer than what you would see in any other competitor out there. Oracle by far has the broadest and deepest definition of what platform means, and that's what middleware is about. And so just to kind of bring that perspective for me is that, okay, there's no general purpose software platform anymore, because workloads are driving everything, right? So you take engineered systems, great success by Oracle. People were poo-pooing that five years ago. You know, like, oh, hey, you know, purpose-built boxes are passe. Turns out that was a bad, bad angle. It turns out people want integrated solutions. But now the integrated stack is in the cloud, and it's driven by the workload. And there's a variety of work, well, there's a zillion right. workloads. That's right, that's right. So that's the, that's the key point. So what is that? What is your view of integrated cloud from a standpoint of middleware? Because now you're saying to yourself, okay, I don't want to run on-prem, I don't want to run in the public cloud, I want to run the same software for my workload, but now I have horizontally scalable and vertically integrated software right. that's on a per workload basis. That's a challenge. So let's understand, first of all, there's, there's two dimensions to this. First is to do with, the kind of workload, right? You might have a Java J2E workload, that's Java cloud service, instantly scalable, instantly installed, very easy to manage, very easy to patch, we do it for you. Um, the next one would be, perhaps you have a .NET workload. Well, we have infrastructure as a service for that, you can just bring a .NET workload over here. What if you're not programming in Java at all? Perhaps there's JavaScript and you're programming in Node.js, Node.js in the cloud. There is a movement out there where, where our customers are programming in microservices, in the microservices-based architecture. And they just want to run on Java SE. So we have a Java SE service with containers built in. So you can run your microservices loads over here as well. In fact, that is one of the coolest things that we've done. All of this, and that's, this is one dimension. The second dimension is all of this is available either in the public cloud or on the private cloud, which would be in appliance that you installed behind the firewall at the customer's data center as well. Yeah. I, when, when, you, when you look out at not only, you know, I mean, we're a huge number of customers that are here, and, and we contrast that a little bit, we go to some of the open source events, you go to the Apache events, you go to 
velocity and some of those, a lot of them are, are building sort of platforms on their own. I mean, there's a ton of things they can use, Kubernetes and Mesos and you know, scheduling algorithms and, and applications, platforms as a service. Do you guys feel like you need to go off and get that next generation of developer, the ones that are building the cool Silicon Valley companies, or do you feel like the, you know, the money in the market is still in, you know, around Java and the services you just talked about? Well, the honest answer is we do need both, yeah. okay? We have an existing large customer base that is very loyal and very much engaged with our existing products that are now moving to the cloud. Having said that, we're not sitting still. We see an opportunity in building a microservices platform that is over and above these scheduling packages, perhaps like Mesos or Kubernetes, okay? Wrapping your own is simply not value added anymore. And once you take that a microservices platform and have it integrated all the way up from the infrastructure layer all the way to the platform and software as a service layer, the integrated value of that is what nobody has. That's what Oracle's strength has always been and continue to be. That's interesting, let's talk about that. That's, that is what customers want. We're seeing Amazon's success driven by that pure dynamic. Now granted, infrastructure as a service, pure play developer, I get that. Now you get in the enterprise, it's complicated. Right. And so I got to ask you this question, because the theme that's coming up in our CUBE uh, events we've done in the past year and a half, say two years, is it sounds great on paper to pick the shiny new toy out there, but the cost of ownership involved in coding, and I, when I say coding, I mean I got to write new code, right. okay, it's a big deal. And this, there seems to be way too much to do from a software perspective already. Like you mentioned microservices, containers, things of that nature are enabling faster development. So the, there's a big theme developing called I don't want to waste myself coding on something. Is that a big driver of how you guys are, are, are your value proposition? Because if you have an integrated stack, things like version control, things that are pre-existing software can be leveraged. How big of a deal is that, if, if any, or what does that mean? So let's stick with, I think the question is, I can break it down into two dimensions as well. One is to do is to make the life of the developer easier, right? So um, writing your own, having your own Git repository, for example, or integrating that with a continuous integration pipeline, for example, or Hudson or Jenkins job. Um, creating the, the scheduling mechanism that actually creates Sunshine. our Docker container. All of that can be done today, on the Oracle Public Oracle. Cloud, right? But there's another aspect to this, though, is Sunshine that is um, when you do this, the integration and providing a tool, for example, that would take about 80% of the job away from the developers, all the way down to what we call a citizen developer, and make the job very easy for them, is our, a major direction from our side. So, when I look out in the future, 70 to 80% of what it takes to extend the SaaS application should be able to be done in a tool. And then if you extend it, you extend it using REST-based service that's been exposed in the PaaS layer as well. So both dimensions are very important. Yeah. So we're going to ask the competitive hard question. It's uncomfortable, but bring do it your up. best. Bring it on. Um, differentiates versus the competition. A lot of people going after Oracle, they're building their own database. You've been doing that for years. Okay, so okay, I get the easy answer for that. You've been doing it for a long time. Salesforce, Salesforce IQ, Adobe, and Amazon all entering the database space. What's your answer to those guys? What do you say to your customers? Hey, you know, they're, you know, Johnny come lately, or hey, congratulations, welcome to the game. What's your, what's your response to the competition? Welcome to the game. I think we've been at, we've been at it for a long time. Our, we feel very confident of our offerings in the marketplace, both on-premise and in the cloud. We continue to invest in very specific options on our on-prem products that are far, far differentiated. If you look at the offerings out there, uh, you know, they have size, different, size limitations, they have scalability limitations. We've been at this for the enterprise scale for a long, long time. There's we have no doubt in our mind that we'll be successful here. You know, one of the things, having a computer science degree, then getting an MBA, you learn some buzzwords. So the buzzword I learned in business school was diseconomies of scale. So when you try to match a trajectory, say Oracle, say I'm a competitor, I say, hey, I'm gonna, hey, good job, I'm gonna copy you so I come out with all the features, there's diseconomies of scale. And, and that's important for customers. I want you to point out, where is the holes in the competition? And if you have to poke a hole, hit that one little straw that breaks the camel's back, where is the diseconomies of scale that those guys are, are going to be exposed for? Because ultimately, they can cover it with messaging, they can have some products out there, but they're not going to have the trajectory and experience that Oracle has. How do you poke a hole in the competition? So let, me, let me segment the competition into multiple you know, parts, though. One set of competition are the guys that are infrastructure up, right? You have Amazon, for example, you can see, they start from the infrastructure, trying to move into the platform. 
Um, then there's the guys that actually move from software as a service down, where they, where they have an application, like a CRM application, and they produce a platform that they use to extend this application, and a little bit more, right? Both have big holes in them. If you look at the SaaS down, it's primarily designed to extend only one application. It's not designed for generalized load. Hell, in a, com in a complete multi-tenant environment, you can't even VPN into your load, into your environment, right? If you really wanted to do enterprise class deployment of your uh, you know, custom application, very hard to do it in, in these custom, how should I say it, extension of SaaS platform providers. Yeah. Yeah. Now go from infrastructure up. I think the hole there is, frankly, they're a mile wide and an inch deep. When you take each one of these offerings and ask the question, what does it take to do a scalable cluster across, hot pot across multiple data centers, and to keep it up and patch it over time, the total cost of ownership of what we provide from a platform perspective is bar none the best in the marketplace. Yeah. So the, when you see it the, from both perspectives, we actually have the most powerful platform out there. We're, we're obviously seeing you know, mobile, Internet of Things. I mean, we're seeing entire companies built where that's, that's their business, right? Uber is an example, Airbnb, and you know, a lot of these Internet of Things platforms. What, what has to change in the middleware space? to Because to, they're not built like three-tier applications. They're not sure. built like you know, traditional enterprise. What changes in your world, and, and can you extend the existing platform? Do you have to build a completely different middleware platform to address that? In fact, I, I don't think we have to build a completely new internet platform. Um, we actually are releasing an IoT cloud service. I kind of joke with, our, uh, with my own team that we said there is no IoT market. There's an IoT applications market. Yeah? So when we're going about the IoT platform, we're actually, in fact, eating our own dog food. Right? There is a gateway part of this, which is integration to the, to the end devices. There's a cloud service part of it. There's an identity management part of it, securing the devices as they communicate over. Um, there's a translation integration part of it. All of this is ICS, the guts of innovation cloud service built into it. And then there's real time and batch intelligence on top of this. All of this, if you look at how we're using our own platform for IoT, is very exciting. And here's the kicker. We have thousands of customers who are already our on-premise apps customers that are doing manufacturing ERP. All of them are looking for a way to monitor and derive intelligence from these devices not suddenly start speaking. That's how we're approaching the market for IoT. It's almost the same problem the way you laid out the competition. IoT, you're either infrastructure or you're an app and you're kind of stuck between those two that's points. That's right, that's right. I would agree with you. I think there's an IoT app market only. The platform's called yeah. distributed computing. You're right. <laughs> Welcome to, it's edge of, called edge of the network. Right. Now people and things are but now the edge of the but network. But what's inside that IoT app is complex event processing, is business intelligence, is integration, perhaps some custom coding. What does that look like? That looks like the platform with yeah. developers, with yeah. analysts. It's, it's fun chatting with you. I love the range that we can hit on, so I'm going to push the envelope a little bit. Let's talk about IoT at the edge of the network. Forget IoT, just talk about the edge of the network. Humans and machines are, are now the data sources. So that's going to change some of the dynamics like identity, security, we talked about end-to-end -end security. What's your vision on that? Because this is going to bring up a whole other level of computer science, new cloud architecture, potentially new applications, potentially new tweaks in the infrastructure, orchestration, automation. Because there's a lot of data. How do you parse through zillions and zillions and zillions of data coming in? You need machine learning. So again, back to the computer science side of it. What's your vision? In fact, I'm actually doing a session, an entire session on this in Open World. Um, there's three parts to this. One is a tool set that you produce for the data scientists that are able to parse through millions and millions of rows. By the way, nobody can do a, you know, a, a query on the entire data set. You have to do sampling. And to provide an infrastructure that sits on top of Hadoop, MapReduce, or Spark, with data sitting on top of it in HDFS, it makes the visual face of that for the data scientist a very cool thing. Now you take into the data factory part. How do you get the data sets ready and curated that it get loaded into these, um, into these what are called data lakes? We've taken our ODI, Oracle Data Integration Infrastructure, that is now directly produces um, the transformation logic using Uzi, using Pig, using Spark. So it's sitting natively inside the cluster. When you actually bring these two things together, and marry it 
with perhaps data sets that are sitting outside of the big data infrastructure in the database and doing distributed queries across them. This is a big data SQL product. Nobody has the breadth of what we do. This is how you make sense of the millions of rows of data coming through. We're getting the, the wrap up here. I just don't want to stop because it's so awesome. Um, data visualization obviously is there, sampling, it's hard, I mean, what, you can't make a mistake. I mean, you got to be precise. That's going to be really difficult. So all this is horsepower. At the end of the day, throw more compute at it potentially seems to be the answer. Or, or moving compute around. Intelligent, well, I, intelligent compute. I think it's, it's not just throw more compute at it. Be intelligent about it. Let me, let's take the million row example, right? It's not just about sampling in batch. It's sampling in an iterative way. Yeah. If you have a large data set, the business user should be able to sample the data set, derive some, perhaps, intelligence from it, see some problems in the data, run a job to fix it, resample the information, and keep iterating. That's how you make sense of it. Well, and you, and you got to visualize it for really a new set of users. I mean, if you're, if you're visualizing for a first responder, for example, they're not a computer science person, right? They're not a, they're not exactly. a hedge fund manager That's that right. looks at trends. You're, you know, to a, a hospital worker, they're not a computer science person. You've got to think about visualization differently, I would think. I invite you to come, you know, see our demo for Big Data Discovery, which is a, a product that we launched last year. This year we're launching a Big Data Discovery cloud service for that. It does exactly that, right? In normal business users just looking at data sets, trying to figure out intelligence. In fact, there's another service called Data Visualization Cloud Service, which you will see um, our CEO using personally. Right. Andrew, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. I know we're getting the wrap here. I asked one more question to kind of end the segment. A little more of a forward-looking, community-oriented question, help benefit society. You guys are building a platform, obviously you're enabling new apps. I mean, not just Oracle apps, just if you take your thesis forward, it's just not just Oracle. That's it's right. everything, right? So open source and new things. That begs the question, startups. If you are an entrepreneur, you're in your 20s again, knowing what you know now, okay? <laughs> Great, it's a lot easier now. Yeah. No, offense, no, no, no offense, young guys. It's a lot easier now to do a startup. But being successful is critical. What should they work on? What are the white spaces for startups in the new Oracle, in this new integrated cloud era, client service behind us? We're moving on to a whole other modern computing era of software. What, what do you do if you're a startup as an entrepreneur? So here, I'll give you some certain dimensions to think about, right? If I, am, if I was in my 20s today, I would launch something, one, in data analytics. And data analytics to do specifically with very key business problems. Let's take point of sale data or interaction data for IoT in manufacturing specific to discrete manufacturing. The amount of opportunity that exists to better society and to actually derive real business value and change people's lives is just immense. Oracle kind of started that right. way as a database. That's right. You know, it, it, own one years thing. Ago. That's one dimension that I would take a look at. The second dimension is the face of how development is done is changing forever. We have you know, when you take a look at even Mesos and Kubernetes, right? The amount of tooling that is written around these infrastructure tools to get something ready, it's just insane. There is a giant opportunity in the middle to produce a platform. I see an opportunity very similar to what we saw in the mid 90s with an application server. There is an opportunity here. Indradeep Singh, Executive Vice President of Oracle Fusion, Middleware, and among other things, great guests on theCUBE. Thanks for sharing that data and insight and sharing your, uh, your insight with others, appreciate it. Go to siliconangle.tv, you know we have podcasting now. Go to crowdchat.net slash OOW15, our new engagement container, built on the cloud, join the conversation. We'll be right back more with theCUBE here on Howard Street for Oracle Open World after this short break. Yeah.